Good to be here. I hope each and every one of you had a fantastic Thanksgiving. You feasted with family and friends and loved ones, and you had a great celebration. Uh, I'll start off this morning. We were we were actually driving home from our family celebration Thursday night, Thanksgiving Day. It's late that evening. We're driving home from spending time with family and friends. And my wife turns to me in the car and she says, well, it's officially Christmas. <laughs> and most of the time I tend to agree with her because it makes my life better. Um, but this time I had to actually say, okay, wait, 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 wait. Can we pump the brakes just for a second? Can we pause just for another hour together this morning. I know the decorations are up. I know it looks a lot like Christmas, but the reality is the first Sunday of Advent is actually next Sunday, December 3rd, and we are kicking off our Christmas celebration with the 60th annual presentation of Handel's Messiah. So every one of you plan on coming back, invite everybody you know. It's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss it. Come and be a part of next Sunday. But today, we're going to wrap a bow on, or, or better yet, we're going to put an exclamation point at the end of our study of Joseph. We have been looking over the past five, six weeks uh, at the life of Joseph, and today we are looking at the defining moment, the pinnacle, the summit, the, the climax of Joseph's story and Joseph's life, and it is summed up in a couple of uh, sentences found in Genesis chapter 50. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 50. We're going to be looking at verses uh, 15 through 21 together today. And uh, as you're doing that, let me kind of remind you of where we've been. If you were with us five weeks ago on our first lesson, we know it began with a dream that God uh, planted in the heart of Joseph, right? God had a plan, a purpose for Joseph's life that was realized through a dream as a teenage boy, right? Then we saw that through that, we walked with him through the twists and turns and the detours, the pitfalls and all the things going on in Joseph's life. We saw him then go uh, from that dream to his brothers beating him up, throwing him in a pit. From that pit, he was sold into slavery. The, slaves, the slave traders sold him into Potiphar's household. Potiphar's household, uh, he moves up in authority. His wife then makes false accusations against him. He lands in prison. He needs to go to prison. So there's two relationships there. He meets two guys. The baker doesn't end so well for him. He gets executed. The cupbearer's there. He gets restored. He remembers that he interprets their dreams. He tells them, you're going to be restored. He goes back to work for Pharaoh, forgets about Joseph. Two years goes by, then Pharaoh begins to have dreams. Then God puts it back on the heart of the cupbearer to remind him of Joseph, who was in the prison, who could remember dreams. He comes, goes and gets him. He comes into Pharaoh's house and interprets the dream. Remember, it was seven years of bountiful crops, and then it's going to be seven years of famine. He does it just in time to prepare his people. He rises to a place of power just in time to feed his family in the midst of a famine. That's where we've been. That's what we've talked about, and here we are today, right? So today, we're towards the end of Joseph's life, and as we move into our verses today, it is important for us to know that at the end of chapter 49, Joseph's father, Jacob, has passed away. And fifth, chapter 50 opens up with uh, Joseph lamenting and crying and grieving over the loss of his father. Seventy days he mourns and grieves, and then he has him embalmed and buried and very ceremonially honors his father's death. But at that same time, his brothers now have become fearful that potentially the protection of their father over them is now gone, and the wrath of Joseph might be coming. He might be seeking to, to bring about revenge upon them, and that's where we pick up in our story today. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Genesis chapter uh, 50, looking at verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said to him, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because the, they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father, Joseph, uh, God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and they fell down before him and they said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear for I am in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. 
Did you see the defining moment of Joseph's life? The pinnacle, the climax, the drop the mic moment of Joseph's story. It was found there in those verses there when, he, when they come and they, his brothers are bowing before him. The fulfillment of the dream, by the way, that began five weeks ago. They bow before him and he says, do not fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So that what? So that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Why is this the pinnacle statement? Why is this the defining moment of Joseph's story and Joseph's life? Because in those verses, what he is declaring, what he is proclaiming is, I have seen the providence of God. I have uh, I understood the purpose, and I am trusting in the providence of God. The question for us is, today is, have we? Have we seen, have we understood the purpose, and are we trusting in the providence of God? That's what we're going to be looking for. Before we go any further, let's take a moment and let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless us in our time together here this morning. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, God, we ask that you would just meet us right here in this place. Meet us as we are. But God, do a work in our hearts and our lives this morning. God, open our eyes up to see your providential hand in all that you do and through all of our lives. God, bring us to a place of trusting in that providence. And God, bring us in a closer, deeper, more intimate relationship with you. God, you speak. Let it not be my words, but God, take what I have to say and somehow use it, anoint it for your purpose and for your glory to do work in each of our hearts and each of our lives that when we would leave this place, God, we would be closer, more in love with you. And God, we would trust you in a deeper, more meaningful way than we ever have before. And God, we pray that all that we do, we do it to bring glory and honor to you. We love you. We praise you. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Oftentimes, when I get up to preach, God has to preach to me before I preach to you. And that is true in, in some of, through a, a series of recent events. A, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was headed out on a mission trip to Cuba. And uh, uh, I was super excited. I was going with seven, there were seven of us total on the trip. It was me and six other men, uh, five great friends, and one of them was my son. And so I was super thrilled, super excited, looking forward to being able to go to Cuba with my son. And we had been preparing and, and planning for this trip for a long period of time. In fact, uh, over a hundred days out, we had applied for our religious visas. We had booked our airline tickets. We had made all the reservations. We had prepared everything. We were plan planning on going to Cuba. 48 hours before we were to get on a plane to fly to Cuba, they finally approve our religious visas and they send them to us with one exception. Mine doesn't come. So we jump on the phone, the phone kind of in a moment of panic. We call the pastor there in Cuba, Pastor Joey, great guy. We said, hey, what's going on? He says, let me figure out what's going on. He calls the consul. He calls the, the convention there. They begin to work on it. He says, we're going to expedite it. I'm sure we're going to get it to you any day. I got two days. He says, don't trust me. I'm going to get it. We're going to get it to you. November 1st, 10 o'clock that night, we were to fly to Miami, November 2nd. That night at 10 o'clock, I still did not have a religious visa. So the pastor, Joey, says, hey, don't worry about it. Get on the plane. Go ahead. Fly from Houston to Miami. We'll expedite it to you. I am confident you're going to get it before you get leave Miami to go to Cuba. So I do. We fly to Miami. I get to Miami. Um, we arrive about midday. We wait all day long. No religious visa. About 10 o'clock that night, we learn that there's actually a kiosk in the Miami airport that will expedite you a temporary tourist visa. So we talk to the pastor. He says, yeah, go ahead and do that. Get into the country and we'll, we'll figure it all out. Okay, so 
Uh, Tom Schiavone was actually the trip leader. He's back there. Him and I run 10 o'clock at night. We go over to the airport. We find the guy. We said, hey, there's a kiosk there. It'll give us a thing. He goes, yes, but you have to do it on the same day you're flying. I said, well, we're scheduled to fly at 8 o'clock in the morning. He says, the kiosk open at 5. We were there at 5 a.m. Alone. <laughs> we sat waiting for someone to man the kiosk until about 7 o'clock that morning. I was scheduled to board at 7.30. Our flight was at 8 a.m. Lady comes, I give her my passport. She says, it usually takes about an hour to process. I said, here's the deal. Told her the situation. She says, let me see what I can do. They announce time to board the plane. I'm in boarding group one. I get up, I stand. Now, now understand, here, here's what you need to know. To get to the kiosk, I had to check into my flight, check my baggage and go through security. So at this point, the only thing I know for sure is my luggage is going to Cuba. That's all I really know, right? And so they make the announcement. I'm in the line. I'm ready to board the plane. And I still have no religious visa. The lady walks out, hands me my temporary religious visa. I scan my ticket and I walk onto the plane. But here's the thing. One thing I remembered in the back of my mind is Pastor Joey says, there is a slight possibility that when you get to Cuba, they're going to see You've applied for a religious visa. You're coming in on a tourist visa. They may stop you, put you on a plane, and send you back to Miami. So I had that going for me. So I prayed like I've never prayed on a flight before in my life. We land in Cuba. Thankfully, we go right through, no problem. We meet Pastor Joey. We get on a bus. He heads us out to the church. He sits down and he says, hey, I'm so sorry for the mix-up. I'm not sure what happened. I apologize, but I am working on it. I am confident you're going to get it any day. Three days in Cuba, I am relegated to sitting in a church. I can't go out with the team. I can't do anything religious. I can't be a part of everything that's going on. I sit in a church and wait for the team to come back. In fact, that Sunday, I was supposed to be preaching in one of the churches in Cuba. My son actually preached in my spot. They thought Robbie Dobbs was coming to preach. Robbie Dobbs came and preached. <laughs> right? It wasn't until late Sunday evening, in, going into the fourth day of the trip, that they finally called and said, you're good to go. Now, we went through that trip, and it went out, and there was a moment probably towards the end of the trip where I was sitting there and I was reflecting on everything that happened. And I was in, my mind was in preparation, preparing. I was thinking about this message today. I was looking at the scripture and it's as if God spoke to me and goes, did you see it? And I was like, see what? He says, did you see the, my providence? That I was working everything out exactly the way it needed to. And I began to look back over the details of the trip. And that team that went out without me for three days, they produced over 450 salvations in five and a half days. Revival was breaking out. God was moving in ways I never thought possible. Not only that, I got the privilege. You know, my, I tell people my favorite verses, there's no greater joy than to hear your children are walking in truth. Wait until you see them preach. There is nothing greater than to watch your son preach in a foreign country for the first time and see people give their life to Christ. I got to do communion for a church that had never taken the Lord's Supper. We got to go, Tom and I got to go out onto, into the ocean on the shores and baptize 13 people. God was moving in ways we never thought possible. And I just looked back and go, oh yeah, it's the providence of God, right? And that's what, what I want us to look at today because I think that's a microcosm of life. Oftentimes in the midst of our struggles, our trials, our temptations, the busyness of life, all those details, we don't stop to reflect and look back and say, hey, this is the providence of God. God is working everything out for my good and his glory. And we need to do that sometimes. And that's the, that's the essence of the story of Joseph at this moment in his life. As it gets to that point, he is looking back and he is saying, oh yeah, now I see it. I see God has been working everything out perfectly. He has aligned everything just as he needed to be to put me in the right place at the right time to use me exactly for what he called me to do to save my family and to give him purpose, to give him glory, right? And that's what we're looking at today. As we walk in this and we talk about it, we need to first understand what, is it, what do we mean by this idea of the providence of God, right? 
generations ago, I think people were more familiar with that. That was a term that was used more regularly. But today, I feel like it's fallen kind of into neglect. We don't talk about it often. Oftentimes, in our, even in our Christian language, we have confused providence with words like luck or chance or coincidence or even fate or karma. But the reality is, if we're believers in God, those things do not exist. It is all the providence of God. And that's the, the pinnacle statement that Joseph is making in his life as he is looking back. We need to understand the providence of God is, is, is not chance or luck. It is the way in which God refers to, the, to how he is directing the details in our lives to bring about his plan and purpose for our lives and for his glory, right? It is how he is working things out for his ultimate design for the world. Sovereignty is a word that we also interchange. Sovereignty is what we think of most of the times, but sovereignty talks about how everything is under the rule and the control. Everything created is under the rule and control of God. It is very true, right? Big things, little things, all the details, it's under the rule and the authority of God. But providence recognizes it's under the rule and the authority of God, but he is using it to fulfill or to accomplish his ultimate plan. Providence is what Joseph's life story is. It is a story of providence. And jo there is probably no greater story in the entire Bible uh, on the providence of God than the story of Joseph. It, it shows us how God is working in the details of our lives and causes things to work together for his purpose so that it, when we think about it, we look back, we can see that God's hand was involved in everything. Right? The first step that we need to do to understand and to, to have the same understanding that Joseph came to is begin with this idea, this concept, our point number one is that we need to see the providence of God. If we don't stop long enough to reflect and to look back, we may not see it, right? At this moment in his life, he says, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Now, I have to be careful because I kept transposing those words last year. I kept saying, for I'm in the place of God, for am I in the place of God? Right. Either way, here's what it translates to. How can I judge you? How can I fault you? How can I be angry with you? Did I not end up exactly where God needed me to be? Do we ever look at that? Do we look at our lives and say, hey, through all the stuff, we can look back and say, hey, am I not in the place of God? Right? Did God use me? Did he move me to the to that place for a purpose and for a reason. We see evidence of it all throughout Joseph's story. As we look together at it, I want to just remind us a couple of places to make uh, to drive home this point. Uh, first, I would argue our story began Genesis chapter 37, five weeks ago. We opened up to look at the story of, of, of Joseph, but the reality is God's providence began even before that. Have you ever thought about that? He had to be born into the right family with the right father who would favor him, to the right brothers who would resent him, to the, in the right place, in the right country, at the right time. Have you ever thought about you? Have you ever thought, why were you born in the country you were born? To the family that you were born into, with the siblings that you have. You say, well, you don't know my family. My family's dysfunctional. Hello, Joseph understood dysfunction. <laughs> right? You go, well, you don't know my siblings. Have they beaten you up and thrown you in a pit and sold you into slavery? Well, then you're better off than Joseph, right? The reality is that he is looking back over his life and he is seeing the providence of God. And it began from the very place he was born, the family he was born into. Every part of it was by God's design, by part of his plan, part of God's purpose for his life. But God's not only in the big details about, you know, your, your genealogy or where you're born or your country. He's in the little details. That's what I love about God. And that's what I love about the story of Joseph. If we continue on in the story, we go to Genesis chapter 37, verse 14. One of the early things we see in Joseph's life is uh, the first thing Jacob tells him to do is, hey, go out to the fields and check on the welfare of your brothers and come back and report to me, tell me how they're doing. Do you ever wonder why did Jacob ask him to go do that? Remember, this is the guy that got the coat of many colors, right? That was a sign of uh, that he was management. You're going to give me a menial task to go out into this field and to check on the welfare of my brothers, right? But he went. Do we ever think in those terms that sometimes God calls us to go to places we don't necessarily want to go and maybe in circumstances we don't want to be in, but he's calling us there because there's a purpose and a reason for it, right? 
What is the purpose and reason for it? Well, if we keep following the story, we get to, to love this. This is my favorite part of the, the early part of the story, Genesis 37, 15 through 17. Listen to this. I love this. A man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, him being Joseph, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing their flock. And the man says, they have gone away. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them at Dothan. Have you ever thought about that verse just for a second? So Jacob's instruction to his son is, hey, go out into this vast land. Go find your brothers, wherever they may be, and see how they're doing, and come back and give me a report. What does the verse say? He's out there wandering around, lost. I don't know where they are. Huge field, open plains. And he just happens to come across a man. Not any man, a man who just so happened to hear that his brothers were going down to Dothan. See, it didn't just happen, right? It was providential. God's providence was, hey, I'm sending you out. I need you to have this encounter with this person, right? I have strategically, divinely appointed a person to, to encounter your life, to give you some instruction, to lead you so that I can fulfill my purpose and plan for your life. Do we think about relationships that way today? Do we think that if we don't believe in accidents or coincidence, if we don't think there's chance or fate, then every encounter we have is a divine appointment. Every encounter we have is part of God's providence. Do we think in those terms? As we go to, to lunch today, the waiter, the waitress that waits on you, do you think, hey, providentially, maybe God has me here because this person needs prayer. They need encouragement. Maybe you go and you check out at somewhere and you say, hey, uh, the checkout person, that encounter, it's not by chance. Maybe God has divinely appointed because they need to know the gospel. They need to hear how much God loves them, Right? They, we don't know. We need to understand there is no chance circumstances, right? There is no uh, uh, fate. This is divine appointment. God has put us together for such a place as that. Now, we know he, he goes on and he finds his brothers at Dothan, and we kind of know what happens there. If you were with us a few weeks ago, right? His brothers resent him. They get angry. They beat him up. And they throw him in a pit, right? It's a bad day for Joseph. And, and then it says they are plotting to kill him. And then look what it says. Verse 25, chapter 37. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gun, bomb, myrrh, and on their way, carrying it down to Egypt. So in the midst of their plans to kill their brother, God puts hunger on their stomachs. <laughs> they sit down, they begin to have a meal, and it just so happens when they look up, they see a caravan. Not any caravan, a caravan that was strategically heading to where? Egypt the very place where God needed him to be so that when the famine came, he could feed his family, right? In every aspect of his story, God was at work in the relationships, the people he encountered, and through the circumstances of Joseph's life. Back to a story from Cuba, when I finally got off house arrest and was able to go out with the rest of the team, one of my very first appointments there was to go out with a, a, a church worker out into a village there to meet with a, a lady. On our way, the church worker says to me, yeah, we've been praying for this lady for a long time. She's very opposed to the gospel. She's very opposed to the church. And uh, yeah, we're going to go talk to her. I'm like, Great. First appointment. So we go, we walk in, and as I often do, I try to make small talk. I ask her about her family, ask her about her relationships, ask her about her work, what she did, how long she had lived there, all that kind of stuff. And she was giving me very short answers. She told me she had been married. Her husband had passed away. She had multiple kids. Her daughters had gotten married. They had both moved off. She had a son there that was kind of taking care of her. She tells me that she used to be a teacher, but now she kind of works in the administration side of the school, and she had lived there for about 25 plus years. At that point, I'm out of small talk. So I just then launch in and I go, well, here's what I want to tell you, man. God created the heavens and the earth and his greatest creation is you and he loves you. And I'm going to tell you all about, and she just interrupts me and she just stops us. And through the interpreter, she says, can I ask you a question? I said, of course. She goes, why are you here? 
And I, I was just, I was kind of caught off guard, stumbling over my words. I actually didn't know what to get to say. I didn't know what the response was. And so I, I just kind of mumbled and uttered this. All I know is I've come over a thousand miles to be here in your house at this time on this day to tell you how much God loves you. And the lady began to just weep. Her whole countenance changed. And her story was, she said she had been asking God to show her a sign that he was real and that he loved her. And she gave her life to Christ. You see the providence of God. He uses the relationships that we have. He uses the opportunity. He uses the the things in our lives to position us to be in the exact right place we need to be, to be in the place of God that he can use us for his purpose and glory. All we got to do is open our eyes and see it. But it's not enough that we just see the providence of God. We also need to understand the purpose of God's providence. And we see it when we, when we begin to see the providence of God, it changes our vocabulary, right? We begin to use word providence, not chance or fate or luck. But when we begin to understand the purpose of, of providence, it changes our whole attitude, right? And that's what it did here because he comes in and he says in verse 20 of chapter 50, he says, for as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Don't miss that prophetic language of that last part so that they are kept alive as they are today. Right? He's The purpose of it, he was expressing that he had seen God's purpose behind the providence of his life. And he was saying, who am I to sit in judgment? Who am I to question you? How am I to respond other than to say, God is in control. He providentially put me exactly where he needed to be so that he could use me for exactly what he called me to do. And he says, I understand that purpose. What was the purpose? What is our pur- God's purpose? purpose of his providence today for us was purpose hasn't changed. It was the same. It was for Joseph. Joseph understood fully that his providence was to save that family, right? And if we go back to the scripture, we look back at Genesis 45, 5, uh, look at this. It says, and now do not be distressed. Now understand this is the time you saw this last week. Ben was preaching. Remember, this is when his brothers have come before him and, and they have, at first they didn't recognize him. They're coming for food. He Joseph then finally can't stand it. He identifies himself, tells him who he he is, and this is his response. Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 7, And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. Verse 8, So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me father to Pharaoh and lord of of his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Three times in three verses, he comes back and says, God sent me here. I am right smack dab in the middle of God's purpose, plan, and will for my life. And then when you're there, it changes everything. It changes your perspective. It changes your attitude. This was all part of God's plan to keep the family, that family that he had promised Abraham that he was going to bless the world through. He was going to to make sure that he took care of that, that he fulfilled that promise, and he did. He Every little detail unfolded just the right way according to God's plan in order to preserve the family of Israel. And we know that that family of Israel, looking back, on, he could see God's plan was working out, that everything had worked through. That family of Israel, uh, 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 that family becomes the nation of Israel. Through the nation of Israel, we get the word of God to the world. Through the, word, through the nation of Israel, we get the Messiah, Jesus, who brings Salvation who keeps us many alive today. Right? Had that not all worked out, had Joseph not seen and and responded to the providence of God, had he not met the man wandering in the field, had he not, had he fought his way out of the pit, had he not gone to Potiphar's house, had he not been willing to interpret the dreams in in prison, had he not done one aspect of that, we wouldn't have been, had the word of God, we wouldn't have had the nation of Israel, we wouldn't have had the word of God, we wouldn't have had the Messiah, which brings about salvation for us even today. See, we understand the purpose. The purpose of God hasn't changed. His overall, the overall purpose of God's providence is to glorify his name by bringing his plans to pass and bring people to salvation through Jesus Christ. That was the purpose then. It's still the purpose today. 
The thing is, his providence didn't stop in the days of the Bible. It didn't stop when he saved Israel and raised up the Messiah. God is still working his providence in our lives today. He is still causing all the things, these little details of our lives to work together to bring us and others to Jesus to make sure we, are, we come close to him and that we are bringing people with us. So we understand, we see the providence of God at work in our lives and we begin to understand the purpose and we know we can live that out. There's a great uh, illustration. It was an illustration I was actually going to use if I preached in Cuba. I didn't preach in Cuba, so I'm using it now. Uh, but it's a good illustration. It's Corey Tim Boom. She had a sister, Betsy. They were in a concentration camp. And her sister, Betsy, was challenging Corey to give thanks to God for the fleas and the lice. And she goes, I will not thank God for the fleas and the lice. And she says, well, then we at least thank God that you and I are in the same jail together. Because most of the time they would split family members. They would divide them up so that they didn't have uh, relatives in the same camp. And she goes, of course, I can give thanks to God for that, that he put us in the same uh, cell. I can think, but I'm not thanking him for the fleas and the lice. And she says, okay, well, can you at least thank God that, that they didn't find this Bible that I'd hid in the inner pocket of my coat and that we have God's word with us every day that we can read it and reflect on it and we can pray. She goes, yes, I can thank God for that, but I'm not thanking him for the fleas and the lice. She goes, well, we... Can you at least thank God that every day we get to read it to the other people in the camp, to the other ladies here in the camp, and we get to share the love of Christ with them? And she goes, well, of course, I can thank God for that, uh, but I'm not thanking him for the fleas and the lice. And she says, well, here's the truth. The only reason we can openly read God's word and share it with the girls in the, in the cell, and the reason that dozens, if not hundreds, have come to know Christ is because the guards won't come in here because of the fleas and the lice. And she goes, huh. Thank you, God, for the fleas and the lice. <laughs> that's seeing God's providence. That's understanding God's purpose. Even in the most difficult of their days, they understood God's purpose was that, they, that those ladies would come to know Christ, that they would give their lives to Christ, that they still had opportunity because God was leading them and guiding them providentially to put them in the right place at the right time that people may come to know him. God's still doing that in our lives today. The purpose of God provident is still the same. God causes everything to work together to draw people to him and, and to use us to minister to others. To, to bring about his purpose in our life is to bring us, to both draw us closer to Christ, but also to use us as to be an opportunity to be a witness and a minister for him. And when we see the providence of God and we begin to understand the purpose of God's providence, there's only one thing left to do, and it's to respond. And the reality is our response to the providence of God should, should be to trust Him. See, if seeing the providence of God changes our vocabulary, understanding the purpose of God changes our attitude. When we trust in the providence of God, it'll radically change your life. And that's what God's calling us to. That's what the story of, uh, of Joseph is calling to. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It is that understanding that even when things are happening in my life and the, the things I don't understand, the things that I can't see, that there's any possibility that good could come from them, we can trust God because we can know that He is provident, that He is still at work, and He is using it for a reason, for His purpose, and for His glory, and ultimately for our good. He is leading us on that understanding that we may understand that fully. And some of us, we need to, to respond to God's providence with trust. For some of us in this room this morning, it may be that we need to put a, our, our trust needs to begin believing in Jesus Christ. Right? We, we can't see the providence of God until we are in that relationship, in that moment when we have surrendered and we put our trust, our faith in Christ. And we can then know that God has a purpose and a plan for our lives. And we begin to live life abundantly. For some of you here, that's your first step of trust is to say, hey, yes, I need to give my life to Christ. For some of us, many of us, we, we're already believers, right? We already have a relationship with Christ. We know Christ personally, but we are struggling because there are hard times, there are things, there's pain, there's suffering, there's, there's difficulties happening in our lives. We need to understand God is still working at his providence in our lives for a reason. He is still at work. And even in the most difficult days, we can give thanks for the fleas and the lice. 
Because God wants to use us to make a difference in, in someone else's life. He wants to ensure that many, many will know life today. He wants to do that through us, through each and every one of us. Some of us, we need to understand we're not in our jobs by chance or circumstance. We have been strategically placed there by God. We need to begin to look at the marketplace and say, why am I here? It's not just to earn money. It's because God has got you there. There's a relationship that he is working on. He is wanting to use either someone to make a difference in your life or he's looking for you to make a difference in someone else's life. Maybe in our community, in this city, why are you here? We begin to look differently to say, I'm not here by chance. I'm not here by fate. It's not karma. The reality is it's the providence of God. He is trying to work something out. You're here for a reason. Even in this church, you're here because God has divinely put you here in this place for a purpose, for a reason. What's left for us is how do we respond? How will we respond? Our response in every situation of life needs to be that we trust the providence of God. He's placed us where we are. He's directed the specific people and events in our lives for his purpose. So we need to trust his plan in every circumstance. And he is working his providential plan through every area, every aspect of our lives. Sometimes he does that through a glorious provision. Sometimes he does, does that through pain and suffering. But in either case, God is at work. He has a plan and purpose. He wants us to know the full extent that he wants us to know the full extent of Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. If you are the Lord's, there's no accidents. There's no luck. There's no chance. There's no karma. For those of us who believe in the God of the Bible, like the story of Joseph, we seek the providence of God. We believe that there are things that may look bad, but God intends them for good. He has a plan. He's working every detail of it out to advance his kingdom and to lead his people to himself and to glorify his name. And he wants to do that through you and through me. So the last question is, will you? Will you trust in the providence of God? Let's pray together. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. And God, we just ask that God, you would move in the hearts and lives of each and every one of us, even now. God, I pray if there's someone here this morning who is struggling, that they understand that God has worked those, that providence, those, those hardships into their life because he is trying to draw you unto him. God, would you allow them to surrender, to come to put their faith and trust in you. Maybe there's others here who are believers, God, but they're struggling. They've lost sight of your providence, God, because they focus on the pain and the suffering, and it's hard. God, would you just encourage them? Would you affirm in them this morning that you're not done yet, that you're drawing them to you? God, that they would seek you first above all else. And God, then you would do a work in, in their hearts and in their lives. And one day they would look back and see your providential hand. And God, your purpose for their lives. 